Right now, I am walking through a place that used to be the village of Fleury on the Verdun battlefield. In a previous episode, we talked about how in late June of 1916, the, the Germans advanced from the north and pushed into Fleury, and the fighting here was going to reach a level of intensity that is just impossible to fully comprehend. Possession of this village would change hands 16 times uh, during the course of the battle. And it was kind of like an ocean wave uh, that just swept over this village. And every time it would advance and recede, it, it would just leave more and more destruction until there was nothing left of this village. Well, by June 23rd, the Germans had largely taken possession of Fleury. There was still some French in, in different pockets. And General Falkenhayn had a problem on his hand. The Battle of the Somme was about to begin, and he was needing to start pulling ammunition and reserves to meet the threat that was about to uh, be launched over in that sector by the British. So, understandably, there was a little bit of urgency on the part of the Germans. So there was a decision made to make another big push here in the Verdun sector. Fort Douaumont had already fallen. Fort Vaux had fallen. But there was one more fort in this area called Fort Souville. And if they could overtake this position, it would bust the gate wide open to the city of Verdun. With the German plan to move south and take Fort Souville, you can kind of think of it in a couple different wings or phases. Uh, so the German Alpen Corps, which had originally attacked right here in Fleury, they were brought back in. They had just been beat all to pieces, uh, but they were brought back in to help clear the rest of the village. And then uh, a group called the Lieb Infantry was going to move through and advance towards a place called the Powder Magazine. Further down, uh, another group of Germans was going to be clearing out around Fort Vaux, and then there was going to be a push there towards Fort Souville. But right here around Fleury is where the action started. Now in that episode where we were here at Fleury, we saw all of these markers that showed where the structures used to stand. And they've done a bunch of clear cutting here which i think is a good thing because it helps to kind of bring us into 1916 and on some level visualize what this place looked like but even still it's obviously not the same if we would have been here in june of 1916 this would have been just a treeless moonscape uh there would have been shell craters everywhere and uh, just remnants of of trees and of course as one french soldier said uh, it would have been paved with corpses. Now, even though in late June, uh, the Germans knew what they wanted to do, they had to postpone the attack until the second week of July because they were waiting for some phosgene shells to make it up to them. Uh, in the meantime, it started raining, and this place became just as nasty as you can imagine. Uh, all of these shell craters filled up with water, uh, again, there are just corpses everywhere that are rotting. So, I mean, just imagine what it must have smelled like right here in Fleury. Uh, but anyway, on July the 10th, the Germans opened up an artillery barrage. The French had actually captured a German soldier and found out what the plans were. So when the Germans opened up their artillery barrage, the French launched a counter barrage 
that absolutely rained shells down everywhere in this sector. The village of Fleury was being defended by French troops that were, were honestly under strength in this area. So when, when the Germans move through here, they're able to, to overtake them and move down this hillside, but the, the shell fire that is raining down on them is just creating havoc. Uh, it's causing units to, to get separated and uh, they, they can't uh, communicate. But in spite of that, they're able to move through here, move through the village, and here on the, the right flank of the German advance, uh, move down to the powder magazine. I've moved to the southeast of Fleury, and uh, from where I'm standing, as a matter of fact, you can actually see the Duamont Ossuary. And from this position, we can see where the Germans who had taken Fleury advance. They, they come right through here, going from our right to the left. Uh, they go and they take the powder magazine uh, and then some of them advance even further to a network of trenches that was called the Laos. And that's about as far as they're going to get on July 11th. Okay, so that's all the right flank of the attack. Now, the left flank of the attack, it's kind of hard to see because we have all of these trees and underbrush in the way. But the, the left flank of the attack is going to be coming in this direction. And its target is going to be right up here at Fort Seuville. Yeah, well, look at here. In our approach to Fort Seuville, uh, we've found ourselves in an old trench line. And I can't have an old trench line here and not just walk some of it at least. Uh, now we've been to a few forts on this trip. We've been to Duamont, we've been to Fort Vaux, uh, we've been to Fort Regret, and each of them have been unique in their own way. Uh, they all started off the same. They all had to go through some different upgrades uh, in, the, in the late 1800s, and early 1900s. And Fort Seuville is no exception. Uh, now, Fort Seuville, it was either the first fort or one of the early forts that was built in the Verdun sector. And, uh, like I said, had to go through upgrades. Now, something that makes this one a little bit different. This is not the fort. The fort is actually in this direction, about maybe 150 yards. Uh, this is a 155 millimeter gun bunker uh, that was built off to the side of Fort Seuville. Um, so anyway, here, I bet if we go up here, we can see the disappearing turret that goes with this. There's the observation port right up there. And, yeah, here I can see the steel dome. So here's the uh, disappearing turret for the 155 millimeter gun here at Fort Seuville. Now, this gun was in action during the first part of the Battle of Verdun. I can't remember how many rounds it fired off, but then there was an explosion 
in one of the tubes and it ended up ended up rendering this 155 millimeter gun inoperable which <laughs> between the dates of uh, June 23rd and into mid-July that was really inconvenient because that is when they needed this gun the most. We just moved over a little bit from the 155 millimeter gun turret that we were just looking at and there's something over here that's pretty interesting and kind of looks like uh, an elephant. Uh, this is called a Pomart casemate. Uh, one of the issues with the disappearing turrets is it can mechanically be unreliable at times. So, for example, if the you know roof gets hit with uh, an artillery strike and it causes debris and rubble to fall, uh, well, so, you know you can get stones or debris in the gears and it can lock up the casemate, which is inconvenient. So these Pomart casemates were easy to build and they were in a fixed position and these would have uh, machine guns in them to help defend the fort. So in each one of these portholes here, which could be closed off, uh, they would have a couple of machine guns that could rotate. Uh, so you would have like one right on top of the other and when you were finished with one, you would just rotate and then start shooting the next one while the bottom one was being reloaded. But Fort Seuville is off in this direction right here. So this casemate, uh, or this machine gun position, uh, would have been used to help uh, protect any advance to the main fort. Alright, we have made it up to the uh, main part of Fort Seuville. Uh, here you can see some of the outer wall and the defenses here. Uh, Philippe Patton called Fort Seuville the, the last bolt in the door to Verdun. So in other words, if this fort falls, the door to Verdun is wide open. So it was vital that the French hold this position and this fort had just been battered to pieces um, on by july 11th uh, the commander of the fort who was uh, a lieutenant colonel and had been an old cavalry officer in the franco-prussian war uh, he had been gassed most of the garrison uh, was out of action so so these guys were in a really really bad shape so on july 11th Fort Seuville, honestly, is hanging on by a thread uh, at a, a very critical moment in the battle. And into this tenuous situation comes an element of the French 7th Infantry Regiment, and they're led by a lieutenant, this, this element is led by a lieutenant named Kleber Dupuis. Uh, Kleber Dupuis gets here to the fort, observes what's going on, sees just how bad the situation is, uh, he, he orients himself on the battlefield. He's like, okay, the, the Germans are ahead of me. Verdun is behind me. Uh, this spot is right in the middle. And he makes a decision that he and the element of the 7th that he is with are going to stay here and they're going to help to defend this place. So he starts moving men and putting them here and putting them there and, and getting ready for the German assault. Uh, if you're familiar with the Battle of Gettysburg, I like to think of him as kind of like a strong Vincent type character at Little Round Top where he gets up there at just the right time, things are really hanging on by a thread, and he makes a, a very important leadership decision that ends up saving the day.
we've moved back down to the road and off in the distance here at the crossroads on the morning of july the 12th the germans launched their offensive onto fort Souville, which is back in this direction now french artillery uh, really played a big part in breaking up that attack but there were germans who made it through and as they were approaching Souville, well lieutenant dupuis and the men of three company seventh infantry regiment uh, launched a violent counterattack to hold them off and they have a monument here to uh, Dupuis and the men of the 7th uh, Infantry of Regiment. Uh, now there's one more monument up here at the crossroads that I want to take a look at that is honestly one of my favorite on the battlefield. Well, right here at this crossroads behind me, this is the high water mark of the German 5th Army at the Battle of Verdun. There were some German troops that got beyond this towards Fort Souville in this direction, but the main body did not get past this crossroads. And there uh, behind me, there is the monument of a wounded lion. Uh, this represents a, a Bavarian lion that has been stopped in its tracks in the approach to Fort Souville. Uh, after, after this action at Fort Souville, uh, both sides would call a halt to all offensive operations that they're done. And yet, the killing would continue into August, September, October, November, and December, because for both sides, they didn't consider counterattacking to be an offensive action. But anyway, that was a little bit on the high water mark right here at the Battle of Verdun.